Good afternoon. Welcome to the meeting of the San Francisco Public Library Commission for August 20th, 2020. The time is 4.30 p.m. My name is Michael Lambert, your city librarian. In the absence of having an incumbent staff member serving in the capacity of Library Commission Secretary, I will be serving as the default Library Commission Secretary this evening. Due to the COVID-19 health emergency and to protect library commissioners, staff, and the public, the San Francisco Public Library and the Corret Auditorium are closed. However, members will be participating in the meeting remotely. This precaution is taken pursuant to the statewide stay-at-home order and all preceding and proceeding local, state, and federal orders, declarations, and directives. Commissioners will attend the meeting through video conference and participate in the meeting to the same extent as if they were physically present. Public comment will be available for each item on this agenda. Members of the public can observe the meeting using the WebEx system by following the link in the library's event calendar or by calling the local number 1-415-655-0000. I will repeat, individuals can participate in the meeting by calling the local number 1-415-655-0001 or 1-408-418-9388 and enter the access code for this specific meeting. The access code for today's meeting is one. Four six six nine five eight four seven four. I will repeat the access code for today's meeting is one four six six nine five eight four seven four. When connected by phone, members of the public can dial star three to be added to the public comment queue. Individuals joining via WebEx should click the raise hand button in the lower right hand portion of the participation panel in order to be added to the queue. Excuse me, that is the raise hand button in the lower right hand portion of the participant panel in order to be added to the queue. Best practices for all public commenters are to call from a quiet location, speak clearly and slowly, and turn down your television or radio. Each commenter will be allowed the usual three minutes to speak. All commenters will remain on mute until their line is open. In facilitating this meeting this evening and to assist in moderating public comment, I will be joined for operation support by the library's digital strategist, Bill Kolb. Mr. Kolb will be calling upon members of the public by name or by caller number to prompt each attendee who wishes to provide public comment. Emailed public comments have been posted to the Library Commission's webpage, along with the agenda and explanatory documents. The chat function built into WebEx will not be monitored by commissioners or presenters and is not intended as a channel for providing comment or feedback to the commission. Commissioners and presenters will not respond to content added to the chat. I will now commence with roll call. Library commissioners in attendance are President Dr. Mary Wardell Giraduzzi, Vice President Susan Mall, Commissioners Ono, Lee, Wong, and Wolf. The Library Commission currently has one vacancy. Madam President. Thank you very much, City Librarian Lambert. Um, hello and welcome to this meeting of the San Francisco Public Library. It is August 20th. Um, we are calling this meeting to order and we want to thank you members of the public who are attending this meeting remotely. Your presence is so important. Um, if you have not done so already, all the materials for this meeting are available for you um, to download on the Library Commission page of the library's website. And that is sfpl.org. Again, if you have not done so already, all the materials uh, for this meeting are available for download on the Library Commission website, which is sfl, 
uh, sfpl.org. We have a total of six agenda items today. So we are going to uh, get started and begin with item number one on our agenda, which is uh, to, op to open this up for general com public comment. So members of the public who wish to provide general public comment should now raise their hands in order to be added to the queue. So if you are using the WebEx interface, click the raise hand button in the lower right hand portion of the screen. Um, and if you have been, if you have called into the WebEx dial, dial in number at 1415-655-0001, please press star three to line up to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair. Operations is checking to see if there are any callers in the queue. If you have not already done so, please raise your hand in WebEx or press star three to be added to the queue. For those already on hold in the queue, please continue to wait until it is your turn to speak. Madam President, there's currently one caller in the queue. Thank you, Operations. Um, please begin uh, allowing general public comment. Caller, your three minutes begins now. Good afternoon. This is Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. Uh, we can be reached at libraryusers2004 at yahoo.com or by mail at P.O. Box 170544, San Francisco, California, 94117-0544. I would like to let the chair know and anybody who's listening that when you made the request for folks to raise their hand now, I did so. I pressed star three and I was told that I was muted. So I had to listen, had to understand, had to press it again to be raising my hand. It's confusing. I thought I'd already raised my hand when I entered the meeting because I thought, yeah, I want to make public comment on item one. The, there was a difficulty for us making public comment at the last meeting. Others have had problems with making comment as well. Uh, we were omitted from making public comment on item two. Since that time, on Monday at about noon, I requested that the city librarian forward an urgent request to the library president, commission president, and the members to please work to make this a better and more successful matter and that I was perfectly, I'd be willing to contribute to that. The city librarian did not forward that until sometime this morning and then he pushed it into general comments that are gonna be buried uh, somewhere on the website when in fact it was an urgent request Monday to alert the library folks what I wanted. And I don't think it's appropriate for the city librarian to blockade communications with the library commission. Likewise, I think it's inappropriate for the agenda to have an item saying, please send your public comments to the library by five o'clock on Wednesday when they're not public comments. They are going to be comments somewhere, somehow. They won't be in the minutes. Your name won't be in the minutes. Nobody at the meeting will hear the comments. It is a complete misdirection and it's inappropriately worded. It should be very clear that you can make public comment during public comment, but that those comments may be sent to the commissioners, but that's the only people that will have a chance to see it unless others find it somewhere buried in the website. It's a very misleading uh, uh, statement within the agenda as though that's how to make public comment and perhaps things might be read during public comment. So uh, I hope that this goes more smoothly. We certainly intend to make public comment every item on every item. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Operations, is there another commenter? Uh, there is another call-in user, Madam President. 
Thank you. If you would put them through. Caller, your three minutes begins now. I fully support what, what Peter Warfield just said. Plus, we're going to be dealing with another question later on that I fully support also that has to do with the, the hub use of the library uh, by uh, in a quasi-public educational function that is not the primary function of the library. Um, but on the general subject of the democratic participation uh, of the public and patrons, and anyone who wants to join in, the Library Commission needs to be far more democratic than it is. We'll give you one more example. Um, the, um, um, you place items on your website that hundreds of thousands of San Franciscans, including myself, do not have access to. To that extent, your meeting is an undemocratic one. You need to make available, and I believe Mr. Warfield has previously um, put forward a proposal of this sort, a, a public terminal, uh, a web terminal that anyone can come to before the meeting and look at the, uh, the uh, items you put on your website that are being used in this meeting. To that extent, again, this meeting is not democratic unless everyone can look at everything you are looking at, all your atoms, all your agenda items, and all your um, uh, added items to your, to your website. Also, the, the way um, the, the Library Commission, including the city librarian, has um, implemented or neglected to implement the uh, mail notices policy um, is a great disgrace. My understanding is that people who have email are getting far more notices than the rest of us who don't have email. To that extent, again, you're being undemocratic and you're not fulfilling your obligations under the federal, state, local, you know, city constitution and the charter of the city and county of San Francisco. You need to be far more democratic than you are. Um, the matter of the way the return, uh, curbside is being conducted is very disturbing. You're not allowing patrons to get receipts for their returned items. There's, uh, there's no reason why the patron should take on the burden of a possible lost item uh, that they have returned. The, you should be uh, issuing receipts just like you've always done when the library was open. This is a burden that you have to bear and take responsibility for. You cannot blame the patron. If you lose an item that the patron returns, that's your fault and not the patron's fault. So you need to be far more um, an answerable to the public. And the, the, the current euphemism we're all using is the count of So good luck, and we need far more participation. I don't think the mayor really wants this to be a, a, a public participation democratic process. Um, Operations. Yeah, uh, uh, do you want me to call out when it's three minutes? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, okay, I thought you could hear the timer. Thank uh, you. Thank you for, yeah, thank you for your comments. There's, there's one more caller. Thank you. Would you put the caller through? Caller, your three thank minutes begins now. Thank you very much, commissioners of the library. I appreciate this opportunity. I want to uh, endorse the comments that have been made by the first two speakers. Um, this is my first time uh, being able to participate at the commission online. I found the procedures a little bit uh, complex, and I think that you should make every effort to make the library commission accessible to the public uh, reasonably, uh, not not complicated, uh, and maybe take a look at what you've done to set up this uh, WebEx, um, you know, communication system. Uh, I think most people are used to uh, going online these days, um, and uh, you know, by by Zoom or some other uh, you know, a common uh, video conferencing tool. Um, this WebEx thing looks. I mean, the procedure to get on, get into it was pretty. Uh, complicated and I I managed to to do it which I'm surprised uh, but uh, and ha actually had to call in, in uh, because I wasn't the screen wasn't 
visible enough in terms of, of putting the uh, the hand raise function on. So uh, just in the interest of, of uh, making this as accessible as possible to the public, I would like you to take a look at your procedures and see if you can simplify it and make it a little bit more uh, transparent for the average folks like like me. And that's my com all I have right now for public comment. Thank you. Thank, thank you for your comment. Um, operations, are there any further commenters in the queue? There are no additional commenters, Madam President. Okay, thank you so much for all those comments made. So now we're going to move on um, to our agenda to item number two. And um, that is a, a discussion on the Community Learning Hub. Um, we're going to hear about the library's partnership with the Department of Children, Youth and Families, DCYF, to activate library locations as neighborhood-based community learning hubs. Um, and I'm pleased to know that we also have uh, the director of the department here with us this evening. So I'm going to turn it over um, to our city librarian who will explain uh, more and then we'll be introducing our director of, uh, of DCYF. Thank you, President Wardell. Good afternoon, library commissioners. Library staff is pleased to share information regarding the activation of SFPL library locations as neighborhood-based community learning hubs. In your package, you have a memo dated August 17th, which provides an overview of the library's partnership with the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. This partnership will enable a citywide strategy for supporting distance learning for vulnerable populations of school-aged children. You also have a copy of the mayor's press release that provides more information about this initiative. In the coming weeks, library staff will be actively working to support our DCYF partners in preparing neighborhood libraries for operation as community learning hubs. In total, 15 library locations are slated for activation as learning hubs. These sites are listed in the memo. Our role is to provide operational support to the community-based organizations contracted by DCYF to manage and operate these sites. This support will largely entail library staff to assist with opening and closing the facilities each day, as well as serving on site as gracious hosts to the CBO personnel who are using the space. We are so honored to have the department head for the department of Children, Youth, and Families, Maria Sue, present this evening to provide an overview of the Community Learning Hub strategy. Maria Sue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Yeah, it's so great to see you. <laughs> and, um, and thank you, um, City Librarian Lambert. Um, I, uh, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to share with uh, the Library Commission what we uh, have been doing and then also to share with all of your constituents on this call. So once again, my name is Maria Sue. I am the Director for the Department of Children, Youth and Their Families. Um, and I actually have to say that I'm a proud user of the uh, Ocean Branch Library right here down the street from me. Uh, my children grew up there and um, we still go there, not right now, but um, have always enjoyed going and discovering our libraries, uh, which is a national treasure for me. So thank you for all the hard work that you um, and all of your staff have done um, for us in the city. So in terms of community learning hubs, um, I am so proud that we in the city were able to not only pivot to make sure that we um, as city government officials help protect and support our residents, but also do it through the lens of equity and to prioritize our highest need children. Um, next slide, please. So when, when the city went into shelter in place in mid-March, we had to very quickly figure out how to continue to support children of essential workers as well as hospital providers uh, because we knew <laughs> that we needed to keep our hospital systems opened 
And we knew that we needed to ensure that safety um, as well as essential services were provided for our citizens. And so the mayor reached out to uh, our department as well as to the Rec and Park Department and consulted with the public libraries to figure out how can we do this? How can we continue uh, provide care for children while their parents were providing care for our city? And so during that time, we opened and stood up something called the Emergency Child and Youth Care Program, which served over 500 children of essential workers and hospital providers um, in the city. And because of that, we as a city have been able to not experience the extent of devastation that COVID has had for the rest of our um, nation. Um, and as we moved into the summer months, um, we once again realized that our children have been cooped up for very long and needed to have some opportunities for them. And so we opened up summer camps. Um, and in, during the summer, actually it's ending uh, this week, but during the summertime, we served almost 3,000 children in our programs, both at Rec and Park sites, in our nonprofit agencies, as well as some of our private providers. Um, and in that experience, we've learned that, number one, children really needed to be outside. <laughs> they needed to interact with each other. and They really enjoyed it. But it also proves that we could do it. And so for the fall, we were projecting to do something for the fall. And now that something um, is landing on these learning hubs. The reason why we need to do these learning hubs and create these learning hubs is for these key and key consider uh, key data points here. Um, our school district has declared that they, for right now, will be providing 100% distance learning to all San Francisco public school students. Um, we know that during the springtime, a lot of students did not benefit from the distance learning that was happening, um, and the students who really needed the most did not benefit at all. So our highest need children did not benefit from distance learning. We also know that as we in the city start recovering from this pandemic, we are slowly opening the gates to um, our economic engine. And we needed to make sure that as parents go back to work, there was a safe place for their children to be during the day. And we know that city services was not going to be at 100% yet particularly our public transportation system. So we needed to make sure that there was a program and a service that was available for children that was neighborhood-based, that met the needs for working families, um, and that also supported children to not continue to, um, to uh, suffer the consequences of this uh, pandemic. Next slide. Our mayor on June 23rd um, issued an announcement that essentially stood, said that we in the city were going to create these community learning hubs to support our highest need children. She said that we it will take a village to address the learning loss of these children in this pandemic. And that is absolutely correct. It takes all of us. Um, it is so true that the pandemic has shown a very uh, bright light on the, the, the disparities that our children in highest need have experienced a very, for a very long time. But it is now very crystal clear to the point where we cannot ignore what we're seeing. So uh, she wanted to make sure that there were opportunities for our highest need children. And that's why we announced the community learning hubs. Before I go further, I do want to acknowledge just how amazing our city librarian, Michael Lambert has been. He has been there from the minute the city went into shelter in place and was there at that, you know, what, 7.30 in the morning call and, and meeting to get ready to stand up um, programs and services for our children. Um, and that's the kind of leadership that um, is what is making this city and the way we're responding um, a national leader um, in the country. 
I also want to acknowledge that he and his staff has also rolled up their sleeves and jumped right in and trying to work with us to figure out how to make this happen. So uh, once again, uh, just lots and lots of, of thanks um, from our partners in the library. Next slide, please. So what is a community learning hub? Um, once again, uh, I want to be clear, this is not a school. We're not opening up a school. We are essentially opening up uh, community spaces that are neighborhood based. Uh, primarily because we don't want to overburden our public transportation, nor do we want to add more congestion on our streets. So it has to be neighborhood based within walking distance from a lot of um, our children's homes. And um, clearly our libraries are beautiful neighborhood facilities as well as our public, uh, public rec centers and a lot of our nonprofit agencies. And so those are the spaces that we're using to stand this program up. Libraries, rec centers, um, nonprofit agencies, as well as some of our um, our religious institutions and some of our private um, companies who are saying, look, we don't have anybody in our space right now. You can use it. So we're really fortunate that people are all coming together to, to tr do their best to try to support our children. Um, I want to say that the, what will be provided there. So the you can kind of think of a learning hub as a full day summer program in the fall. So it's, you know, we'll have staff there who can support the distance learning that children will be logging into. Um, we'll provide the enrichment program um, and the physical activities. Um, the, and then, of course, all the other stuff that, that children need, like the mental health supports and the family supports and a healthy meal. All of this will be provided by nonprofit agencies because they know how to do this. DCYF, as an agency, fund nonprofits um, organizations to provide this type of service pre-COVID. We have over, what, over 200 agencies that we work with. Um, on a regular basis that provides over 450 programs uh, for SFUSD pre-COVID. So what we're asking these agencies to do is to pivot their location of service from schools into these hubs. Um, and, and, you know, I know that there are concerns about, you know, what are these, not, who are these nonprofit agencies? And, and, do they know how to serve children? Well, yeah, they've been doing it for all this time. They're the ones who are fingerprinted. They know all the mandated reporting rules and regulations. Um, and they've built relationships with these children in the past. So there are some concerns around um, safety. And so we need to make sure that we lead with safety in mind, which is why there's a limitation on how many children can be in a space. And um, what, how many adults can be in that space as well. So right now, the maximum number of children is 20, 20 kids maximum. However, another limiting factor is that um, they have to be six feet apart. So if the space is really small, then we can only maybe fit 12 or 15. So there are lots of considerations for, for how these spaces look like, but that means we need a lot of spaces um, because of those limitations. The hubs will start on September 14th, um, and it will operate working family hours. So from Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 5.30. Next slide, please. Here are some data points that, um, honestly, at this point, really is, uh, I know people, people can fully understand and appreciate. Um, We've already heard about the academic slide that children, particularly our disconnected high need children experience from year to year um, and the summer slides that kids experience. But now with this COVID slide, it's we're adding and layering on top of this our social emotional um, uh, deficits. And so in my mind, it's not even just a COVID slide. I feel like it's a COVID avalanche. So not only are they disconnected from, from education and academics, um, but they're also disconnected from a lot of social emotional development and um, well-being. 
And that's going to lead to a whole generation of a lo lot of young children who are traumatized by this pandemic. Um, we're also hearing from San Francisco Public Schools that 30% of families reported that they did not have the best experience um, during summer uh, distance learning in the spring. But more importantly, 19% of them said that they actually didn't have the necessary resources outside of the tech and, and technology stuff. All those other things, the, the social emotional development, the, the caring adults, all those other things that our children need to, to, to learn and to thrive. Um, we're also hearing like a third of our school district parents said that, you know, they weren't satisfied. And then, and then lastly, we know that there's a sector of folks in our city who have the resources to take it upon themselves to take care of their children and um, hire the additional staff that is necessary to support their children um, through this distance learning period. Um, but we also know that a lot of our children who are living in public housing, um, who are homeless, they don't, they don't have those resources. And we didn't want to leave those children behind. And we wanted to make sure that we had an option for those children. Next slide, please. So who are the children that will be prioritized in these learning hubs? These are the children. We are going to prioritize our lowest income families. Our residents of Hope SF and public housing and single room occupancies, our homeless children, our foster care children, and our English language learners. We know that there is probably a very high level of intersectionality of all of these respecters, um, as, as well as racial disparities within this. And so we're going to work really hard to make sure that we meet the needs of these families um, who are African American, who are Latinos, who are Pacific Islanders, um, who are low income Asians. And so we want to make sure, once again, that our most marginalized students and children are, um, are, are heard and cared for. Next slide, please. Um, so what, what did the youth get out of this? So young people will come to a facility. This is actually um, at Balboa Park. Um, no, I'm sorry. This is at Mini Lovey Ward um, out in the uh, OMI, where, where I live. Um, so students, children will have access to a safe um, place. Uh, they will have snacks and healthy meals. They will have access to technology and internet connectivity. Um, and most importantly, they will be supported by uh, dedicated youth development professionals. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of the different um, types of services that our nonprofit agencies will be providing. So for our younger children from kindergarten to fifth grade, they'll be providing a lot of literacy supports, which actually we partner very closely with the libraries to do because you have an amazing literacy program. Um, we'll be supporting STEAM, which is the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math programs. And then of course, physical activity. For our middle schoolers, we will continue to provide the academic supports, the STEAM, physical activity. And for our high schoolers, we'll do the same, but we'll also support them on career and college readiness. Um, and then of course, all sites will have di distance learning supports. Um, and as I shared earlier, uh, all those other supports that we are providing. Next slide, please. How are we reaching out to these students? Um, once again, these are very targeted um, young people that we're talking about. So we're working very closely with the service providers um, who actually uh, are now supporting these families, but also working with our city departments to help with direct outreach. So we're working very closely with public housing officials like Hope SF and um, Mayor's Office of Housing, who oversees the uh, other the rest of our public housing sites, um, as well as the Human Services Agency and, and our CBOs to do direct in-person outreach to these families to invite them to come into these um, into these hubs. Next slide, please. And who are our partners? Um, as I said, the mayor said that it will take a village. And sometimes I feel like it takes multiple villages. 
Um, but uh, so these are all the departments, and this is just a list. Uh, so definitely uh, Rec and Park, uh, San Francisco Public Library, um, Mayor's Office of Housing, Hope SF, Department of Technology, um, Department of Public Health, the Human Services Agency, our Office of City Administrator, and of course, all of our DCYF grantees. Next slide. This is just a partial list. It's, it, if I put all 200 of them on, it just gets too small. <laughs> um, but this is a partial list of all the CBOs that we work with who are saying, yeah, I'm in, I'm all in. Um, and, and not only am I in, I'm ready. And and we and that and we're so grateful. I'm so honored to be working with um, these CBOs who are just ready to roll up their sleeves and dive in and provide that supports that our children need. Next slide, please. And just in closing, um, it does take a village. It takes a village, and we can't do this alone. DCYF cannot do this alone. Um, but if we all work together, we will be able to do this because our children are all of our responsibilities. Um, and I'm just so grateful to be able to be, to be working with um, uh, you all on making this uh, initiative a reality. Uh, I think, oh, do I have more slides? Than, I think that's, I, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you um, so much, Maria. Thank Spirit. you so much. And yeah, that concludes my presentation. And, and I'm, of course, available for questions. <laughs> thank you for your leadership and your partnership, Maria Sue. And that concludes the presentation on the community learning hubs. Uh, library staff welcomes the input and feedback from the Library Commission. And both Maria Sue and I are more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, first of all, I want to thank um, uh, Director Sue for being here. I know that there's going to be some questions probably for you. So, but before we do that, let's go to um, back to the public so they have an opportunity to have general uh, comment. Operations, um, is there a commenter uh, prepared to give public comment? Uh, Madam President, there are commenters in the queue. Okay, would you please put the first one uh, through for public comment, please? Caller, your three minutes begins now. Caller, your three minutes yes. begins now. Yes, thank you. Um, Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. We can be reached at libraryusers2004 at yahoo.com or by mail at P.O. Box 170544, San Francisco, California. 94117-0544. If we were in a real meeting, uh, it would be nice to be able to walk up to people, uh, see people, uh, thank them in person, and so on and so forth. Uh, first of all, uh, certainly we want to say nothing at all that would harm or diminish, <clears throat> excuse me, the opportunities and the abilities of kids in our city to get a good education and have uh, good outcomes in a whole range of ways. But we think that it's extraordinary that this plan has suddenly developed without any advanced commission, discussion, or action, or apparent participation. And neither has there been apparently participation by librarians uh, and staff in, within the library or the public. Uh, what this plan appears to do is to grab, commandeer a number of library facilities, apparently 15, and indefinitely keep them out of use as libraries. The purpose is fine, taking care of kids uh, who need a safe space and so on and so forth, but why aren't, for example, schools being used? There are a lot of schools and presumably they would be completely empty during the whole coronavirus era shelter at home. There hasn't been one word saying why that couldn't be done. Uh, libraries are important for everybody's education, including kids who are very often in libraries after school, for example, and on holidays and so on and so school holidays and so on and so forth. We consider the library to be essential and it should be treated as essential and not as some kind of a place that can be dropped at the, at the drop of a hat uh, just because the uh, 
you know, there's some kind of a thing that uh, has multiple agencies all supposedly going to work together, and that's another issue is how come there are so many uh, so-called partners, 10 according to one of the things. Uh, how is that going to coordinate? How is that going to work? What about using local uh, care centers and so on and so forth? I would like to mention, if I don't know if she's here, but there's an Emily de Zurich Badron who sent something to the Library Commission before Wednesday at 5. She had a lot of questions, including uh, what uh, would the mayor agree that it is her decision not to open all library locations, not to make librarians essential, and not to bridge the divide? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Operations. Can you pick through the next uh, public uh, commenter? Caller, your three minutes begins now. I certainly concur in everything Mr. Warfield has said. Um, and the and the value of taking care of children is immense, probably never been greater with the pandemic. But I am very concerned that this is not a matter that isn't first last and always the obligation of the San Francisco Board of Education. Why isn't this matter before that agency fully capable of fulfilling its obligation to treat children, to educate children, to take care of children? It seems to me on one level rather perverse that you are in effect pushing off the general public and people who don't have, for example, internet from their homes uh, in, in preferring children to these patrons. There's 100,000 of us in San Francisco. On one level, in fact, my first gut reaction was to say, um, I don't understand what's going on. Is this a publicity stunt, an attempt to gain headlines over the, the other needs that the Library Commission is not meeting to its patrons and its population? You are neglecting your duties to the patrons of San Francisco? Not be, you should not be setting up an edu, a competing educational system. That is not your job. Your job, first, force, and almost, and always, is to serve patrons of San Francisco. So I think the Board of Education, this matter should be sent to them, should not be done by the San Francisco Library Commission. Um, let them handle it. Let them take care of this matter. They, are, they, have, they have all the schools in San Francisco to meet the needs of the children. That's why we have an educational system in San Francisco. So I'm very skeptical of the way, and this is uh, consistent with what Mr. Warfield said, this is being pulled out of nowhere and being abruptly uh, foisted on uh, the public and the Library Commission without any consideration of the complexity of it, of the coordination of it, uh, of the effort of it. Um, you need to rethink this and put it on hold until you can fully uh, uh, air the, the, impl the implications of this. And the library should not be neglecting its patrons, which it's doing. Libraries closed, and by imposing rather uh, arcane uh, systems where you deliver a whole bunch of uh, items at the at the. By the way, I think the library is not, it was during the it, during this fire. Um, emergency is not even open for people to return items. So, so th there are multiple ways in which patrons are being stigmatized or deprived of their normal um, use of the library. Um, so, good luck. But I need. To, I think you need to really think hard about what you're about to do. Are you going to be setting up a permanent um, alternative? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Operations, uh, would you put through the next um, commenter, please? Caller, your three minutes begins now. Thank you. My name is Art Persico. I live in San Francisco, and I, sh I share some of the concerns expressed by the two prior speakers in public comment. Um, I, it sounds like a really spectacularly good idea, the uh, community learning hubs. And I just have a question. Um, are, is this creating a conflict in use between the interests of the, the children who would be helped by this program versus those who are uh, library users? To what extent will uh, this use um, block out uh, time and space devoted to uh, 
library patrons. So I, I hope to get an answer to that question. And uh, I would also, you know, underline some of the concerns expressed by the prior two speakers, as I said. Thank you very much for this opportunity to comment and ask that question. Thank you for your comment. Uh, operations, are there more uh, commenters in the queue? Madam President, there's an additional commenter. Please, would you put that commenter through, please? Uh, Marcielle, your three minutes begins now. Hi, thank you, everybody. I would just like to remind the panelists that if you are not presenting, would you please mute? Because for the call-in users, we can hear everything that happens, and it's very loud. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Um, op operations, are there any further um, individuals in the queue? Madam President, there are additional commenters, yes. Yes, would you please put through the next one? Naima, your three minutes begins now. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, yes. you can. Hi, um, as uh, I have put a lot of thought into these community um, learning hubs since we started implementing these programs back in March, um, I, have, I do believe in the need to serve our youth. Um, I see the need, I support the need. I, I have questions about the way we're going about um, this service. There are things that, um, well, for instance, I, I worry that because this is one of the comments that was made was that this was set up like a summer camp or the way in the way that summer camps are. And there would be, you know, it sounded like there would be some supportive help for the students, but and enrichment equities. And I get them being together in shared spaces and 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 connecting with each other and that the need is there. But I'm also curious about how that's going, how that keeps them on par with the rest of the students that are out there that are getting optimum education from virtual learning or support from other tutors and outside um, supports that parents that or you know uh, that that are able to supply support these their youth more how does this weigh in are we actually providing a service i definitely agree with food i definitely see how the library is a safe space for children i definitely see how many librarians would love to step up and support these children um, and their families as essential workers as well I am curious as a person of color if, um, if it, it reminds me somewhat of tracking when I was in school and how all of us were placed in one classroom separate from others and how hard we worked to, to, to get away from that. And I'm not opposed, but I do think these are things that we need to think about and consider. I know it's possibly short term, it's possibly not. And that's one of the things that scares me about this. So I have to be honest to that. I'm ready to step up and support. That's who I am, that's what I believe in. And whether it takes a village, it's community, or we love our, human, our fellow humans, I believe in that. But I do think that there's some deeper issues and I'm only presenting the skim of what I've thought about in this regard. Um, and I think it's really important. Um, I also question how many children we actually have in San Francisco um, in our neighborhoods anymore. I know a lot of my students that are younger and in the age group K through six commute into this. Thank, Thank you for your co public comment. Operations, would you put through the next um, public comment? Caller, your three minutes begins now. Thank you, Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Maria, um, wonderful presentation. Um, and I think echoing what the other callers were sharing, um, the mission, the values, it, uh, that you shared, heartfelt, uh, meaningful, and I think everyone, I think most of the people, I can't speak for all, most of us on the call were committed to our communities, to our children, you know, um, 
uh, I'm a native San Francisco, native, native San Franciscan. I'm a park and rec kid, and I'm a library kid. I do want to just uh, share my principal concern, which is the health of the children, which is I, I'm, I took notes as you were sharing, and you said a maximum number of 20, um, six feet apart. So currently, I'm a disaster service worker working at the food bank, and we're outside. And when you're playing out the possibilities of enclosed spaces, I work at the public library. And I, when I worked as a, a float staff, meaning when I worked at every location, um, I've seen the buildings. The concern is how do you ensure the six feet social distance? Because I don't want to have to deal with the feeling of getting a child potentially ill or sick. I understand that there are community members or uh, teams that are going to be in the building, but the devil's in the details, right, Maria? How are you going to ensure that six feet social distance? Um, we're all committed to kids. We're all committed to learning. We're all committed to vitality. But I think this is the pressing question. I know other uh, callers have raised concerns um, that I hadn't thought of. But this is, I think, the, the crux issue for all of us because we want to make sure that safety is imperative and that um, at the end of the day, nobody gets sick. Um, I worry you because you gave no details about how you were going to ensure this six feet. You gave us broad strokes, but like we said, the devil's in the details. So hopefully you will have a very thought out answer for us, Maria. So um, you would speak to in a building of X size, you said as many as 20 would be the max. So how do you keep children contained? What's the age range? How exactly are you gonna do this? Will there be signage put up? How are you gonna deal with that with children? Children are not robots. They're young, burgeoning life, and they are wonderful. So uh, thank you, Maria, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you for your comment. Um, operations, we have another public commenter. Madam President, that was the last public commenter. Okay, thank you so much to, for all those comments. What we're going to do now is that um, we're going to move this into a discussion of the commission. And what I'm going to do right now is that I'm just going to remind the commissioners that um, we're going to use the uh, raise hand functionality um, on the WebEx. So I will be monitoring um, the page to see who's um, uh, who's available, whose hand is up. And um, I'll call you and uh, both city librarian as well as the DCYF director, Sue, are available uh, to answer your questions. There are, um, uh, so this is only a discussion this evening, okay? So um, trying to make sure I have, I have my, um, just had my hand um, functionality, functionality and then it just disappeared. So let me just hold on a second. If you um, are ready to go, maybe say your name uh, while I'm still looking for my hand, but I just, um, I can't find my hands anymore. So I'm looking at you. It looks like Commissioner Wong has his hand raised. Commissioner Wong. Great. Commissioner Wong, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, Director Sue, Maria, thank you so much for being here and for the uh, the presentation, all the uh, the hard and I'm sure frantic work that has been that has been going on over the last few weeks. It's it's certainly much much appreciated on behalf of everyone in uh, the city, county, of San Francisco. Um, I like to split my my comments into two parts. The first one, uh, sort of addressing a couple of the comments uh, in the earlier parts of public comment with this item, and then Maria, I have one question for you afterwards. Um, so, it, with respect to to some of the points raised about how um, you know. To paraphrase, you know, maybe maybe it shouldn't shouldn't be the public library that is hosting um, these plans, but instead should be the schools. Um, I'd like to remind uh, you know uh, folks who who might have those uh, viewpoints of two points. One is that's a very good question. <laughs> there also happens to be uh, a meeting of the board of education uh, in in San Francisco in about five days on August twenty fifth. Uh, if the question is specifically why didn't why didn't the school district uh, agree to host these uh, um, um, these learning hubs, 
then perhaps it's a better question for that venue instead of this one. Um, and, and second of all, I'd like to, to kind of help everyone uh, zoom back a little bit, right? Because we all know that nobody can predict anything in this pandemic. Um, and if you were to think holistically about the problem, you have a, have a lot of children in the city uh, and, and the schools themselves are not allowed to reopen in its normal fashion. What do you do? Which is the first thing you should do is say, OK, what do we have available uh, uh, to us? And of course, uh, you know, the public library, I think, as an organization has always stepped up um, it, um, the, the institution as a whole, as well as its staff and its le leadership. And so that, I, I suppose, is how, um, you know, we uh, have ended up with the current plan. Um, and so I think to the commenters who, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to believe that there are, um, you know, easily imaginable alternative and better ideas to how to host these learning hubs. There's, of course, the challenge of actually making that happen. And only a few people have actually seen that work through, and, and, and um, Director Sue is one of them. Um, and so... Uh, I guess the point is, uh, when the project is that complex, certainly, like if you if you have uh, an idea that's coming easily to the top of your mind, I think you can rest assured that they have also considered that same question and have, have made certain decisions with that in mind. Um, so, with that said, um, Maria, I, I have one question for you, which is uh, with the specific lens on the library. I actually think the my perception is that the um, the, the communication uh, around using libraries, uh, um, the actual physical branches uh, for these learning hubs actually came quite suddenly. And, and I'm um, uh, interested in your reflections on um, how we collaborated and communicated across uh, these organizations. And, and certainly if um, you know, plans change in the future, um, how we might uh, be able to um, uh, be more proactive in, um, in in making asks and, and coordinating across uh, departments more effectively in the future. Um, so through the chair, can I answer? Yes, you can. Thank you so much, Maria. You're on. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much for that question. Um, and I, I, I will preface by saying this is my first pandemic that I've ever lived through. <laughs> Um, and so because it is a state of emergency, because we are all treading on brand new territories, um, we are moving very quickly. And so I do acknowledge that uh, we're making lots of decisions and and um, trying to meet the needs of our um, of our children and families. Um, as well as balance the health and safety component. Um, so originally we had thought maybe we would have enough facilities available for uh, to serve our community by uh, standing up the brick and mortar uh, buildings of our nonprofit agencies. Um, unfortunately, with health guidance, we won't be able to do that because normally, if you can imagine a boys and girls club, you can put a lot of kids in there, and normally they do. They put hundreds of children in a boys and girls club or a YMCA, um, but with health guidance, we can't do that. And as a result, we need to have more space. Um, and like I said, as, as just really collaborative partners, you all have been with us, um, the, the, the call for support was very quickly um, responded to. Um, and so, uh, it, it was a logical sense. Actually, as some of your comments have said, it's a logical sense that that children are comfortable at libraries. They they know they know that that's where they go to um, to 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 receive care and love. And and it was logical for us to partner with the libraries. Um, and in terms of uh, you know the length of time, right now we are. Uh, we're planning because I am a planner. I have to think about planning, but we're planning for a full school year. But I also do know that the school district is also thinking about eventually opening up. Um, and so that there, there's a there's a lot of just moving parts. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, best practice, I, I'm, a, I'm a child psychologist by training. And so best practice, you need to make sure that there's stability and consistency as you're talking to children and families, particularly our children and families who are of highest need. 
And so it made sense for us to use um, and open up facilities that they are very familiar with um, and that we knew was uh, perceived as a safe anchor for them in their neighborhoods. Thank you. I, I guess my, to, uh, just to, if I could press uh, you a little bit on the answer, um, I guess my question, not specifically of wh why we chose the library, I, I think it, it, I think many of us would probably agree that um, it's it's easily one of the first candidates um, for physical locations. I guess my my question is specifically about um, how we made that happen, um, and, and it it felt like the the coordination between the the two departments wasn't quite clean this time. Uh, in that the the uh, finalization of the request to use these locations may have come a little late or, or perhaps it was done in a very quick manner. And I worry not, not so much that, that, you know, like I think the past is the past, whatever it might be. And, and you know, certainly everyone's trying to balance a lot of different priorities. I worry that, it, you know, in a different scenario, if it were any other set of leadership or any other set of staff at the library, that this would not have been able to, to get finalized in the timeline that it did. Mm -hmm. um, and so in keeping with that, I think my question is more forward looking in that in the future, um, you know, again, knowing that we're not able to predict a pandemic and, and the development of a pandemic and especially how we're going to respond to it, what, what is going to be needed of us uh, in, in the response. Um, how are we going to um, make sure that that if we do need to request more of the library, of any other department, that, that we're able to do so in a timeline that um, allows the um, uh, the partnering agency a little more time to prepare logistics, communications, notifications, things like that. Um, I, I do acknowledge that uh, there, there was very little time to plan for this. When we were informed that SFUSD was going to move to full 100% distance learning, that was, um, they didn't even finalize it. They, they had uh, kind of alluded to it. Um, at their board hearing on July 14th. And uh, we very quickly said, oh no, <laughs> if that was going to happen, then we need to do something to support, once again, those, those highly um, disconnected children. Um, and so, uh, so between June, July 14th to when I actually put a PowerPoint together to show the mayor, it was, you know, I think maybe three days um, because we were we we had we knew that we needed a very long runway. Normally, an initiative of this magnitude would take a year. <laughs> and and, you know, quite frankly, I think COVID time is a you know kind of similar to like dog years, like one day of COVID is like a whole month. Um, and so we've been just working around the clock to try to do this. I once again do acknowledge that I gave you all very short timing, um, but you're absolutely right. Because of this leadership, because of the staff and the team, um, we were able to make it work. But it, it, we will. I promise you that I will try my best to to give way more leeway and runway um, as we move forward in the future. Thank you. Um... Commissioner Lee, um, you are able to want to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Right. <clears throat> if I am I able to unmute myself? No, I can hear you now. You're good. Oh, okay. Um, question number one. I do not know who can answer that. Is that with the uh, uh, SFUSD? making decision of full year distance learning. That means the current program using the library would be at least a year. Uh, now, if that were the case, um, early on, I heard um, Maria mention that uh, Boys and Girls Club and YMC were considered. Uh, would it take Boys and Girls Club or YMCA to take a year to be prepared and therefore have their locations ready. At least we can plan ahead. I understand that Maria mentioned that it came very quickly and library by a process elimination of come up 
as a, a preferred choice, if you will. Um, now that certainly puts our library in a bind with a couple of uh, uh, um, callers mentioning about trade-off, trade-off of the regular patron use versus uh, taking care of the uh, uh, that particular segment that we do not want to leave behind. So my question is, would, uh, how long would it take the Boys and Girls and the YMCA to be prepared such that, that you would be able to consider that as an option so that at least the library would have some way to plan and therefore address the need besides the uh, um, uh, besides the uh, the kids. I mean, I understand the current arrangement is really uh, within the short time. That's, I mean, this current arrangement probably would be the best. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Lee. Uh, so, so have Director Sue respond. Through the chair, um, thank you so much for that uh, question. I do want to to emphasize that we are standing up upwards of 80 sites throughout the city, 80 sites, 15 of which are San Francisco Public Libraries, um, 14 rec and park sites. The rest are nonprofit sites as well as private sites and faith-based community sites. So we are tapping into everyone. So when we said it's a village, it truly is a village. Everyone, we're, we're, we are um, asking um, for, for help everywhere. Um, and I do wanna be clear that um, San Francisco Unified School District said that they will start with distance learning um, this fall. And we don't know when they will uh, be able to move into in-person learning, but um, you know, actually, just based on what Com Commissioner Juan was saying, it's better to plan and it's better to have that level of consistency. Um, so, so that's that was my year preference uh, reference earlier about how it would take a year. Um, but, but just to reiterate, we are standing up 80 sites throughout the city. Thank you, uh, Director Sue, for that clarification. Um, yeah. I'm looking for another, uh, uh, Commissioner Lee, did you have another part to your question? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, okay. Go the ahead. The other question is really to uh, uh, think about one of the caller's comment about the safety. I'm just wondering about whether uh, Maria with the 80 sites uh, in the past so many months with a program that's been also held, uh, what was the experience as far as uh, safety is concerned? Was there any report of uh, uh, either COVID-related safety specifically? Thank you for your question. Um, I can't go into specifics about the, the health piece because I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, um, but I can t share with you that um, in the for the 3000 children that we provided support to during the summer months uh 38 children um came down with an infection the 38 children that re that got the infection received it outside of the summer programs meaning they were infected by maybe their parents or being outdoors or out somewhere else in the community um, and not from the summer camps themselves. Um, the adult infections, um, I can definitely say that from, rec I'm looking for my numbers and of course my desk is a mess, um, that uh, Rec and Park um, had less than a handful. Um, I, I don't, I think maybe two staff from Rec and Park um, and uh, in the on the public side, uh, we had also maybe uh, four staff from the public from our nonprofit agencies. Okay, that at least give a point of reference so that uh, people would know about sort of the nature of the risk. Thank you, and that is the amount of three thousand children. So 
as a good indication or the practice that's put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lee. Are there any other commissioners who would, have, would like to um, um, uh, be a part of the discussion? Yeah, monitoring the hands. I don't see any hands up. I'm back on my my electro my um, technology is working again. At least I'm able to work it again. So I don't see any commissioner hands up. And so I'm just going to make some comments, and I'll keep monitoring to see if any of the commissioners come up. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much, um, Director Sue, um, just for your service um, to uh, provide the type of uh, response in real time without a roadmap um, is really what public service is. So I just want to thank you because I know you have been doing this work for a number of years and um, I know you bring such, um, uh, such competence and a sense of urgency. One of the things I'm not sure that the public um, may not know about, and if we, may, we touched about it a little bit, but I, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about uh, these equity zones that uh, the city and county of San Francisco has designated as areas of uh, uh, what, what are they? What is an equity zone? And, 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 and help the, our listeners uh, understand how your plan, particularly with the 15 out of 28 libraries that were identified, if there was any type of connection in, in that, because I think that that might be helpful. As you said, there's N is, there was really 80, 80, 80 different uh, partners, organizations, as you say, stated, included uh, other um, even religious institutions. But um, I think um, it may be helpful for people to hear a little bit about what equity zones are so they can understand that there is a lot more uh, what the thinking is about how, not only which libraries get um, targeted, but why they're targeted. Thank you for the question. Um, Actually, equity zones are, I think, uh, the, the, that's the language that the library is using. And I'm so grateful that the library commission and the <laughs> library leadership is, is designating equity zones because that reflects uh, our department, which is why, once again, this, the, the partnership and how, how really in sync we are um, with each other because we are, you see, the value of public institutions lifting our neighborhoods and our communities. So from San Francisco, from DCYF's perspective, um, we prioritize, uh, we use an equity framework to prioritize everything that we do. Um, and using that framework, we, we use data. We look at data and, and look and see where the disparities are for our children and families um, and where they live. And we know that, um, Sometimes zip codes of children is a really, really bad, but very solid and strong indicator for future success. And that should not be okay. And in San Francisco, our mayor has said that is not okay. And as a result, departments like yours who have stepped up and said, that's also, we agree, that's not okay. Um, and so you've, you've, you've actually... Uh, done amazing things like your your Bayview Library and uh, the Visitation uh, Valley Library. They're just beautiful um, because you're making those investments for for families and, and residents who need it the most. So for us in, at DCYF, we've prioritized um, four target populations: our African American, our Latin Lat, Latino Latina population. Um, our Pacific Islanders and our low-income Asians, where we say the disparities for these populations are so great that we will pri prioritize and do everything we can to double down on making sure that we help close that gap. And the gap for success for these populations include health disparities, health parity, uh, education parity, as well as economic parity. And so we have to think about how we every day do this work um, to move and close these gaps. And so that's why it was a very natural pivot for us to, to, to open up these learning hubs because we've been doing that. Our CBOs have been on this path with us doing this. 
Um, and so it was very easy to ask our CBOs to stand up and provide this type of service. Um, so uh, just a, a, in a, snap, in a little snapshot of, of, of what the equity lens that we have been using um, to, to really uh, guide how we think about this work and, and quite frankly, how we will as a city um, get through this pandemic stronger because um, quite frankly, this pandemic is really shining that that light in those really, you know, corners of, of our city that we have for far too long neglected and not paid attention to. And as I said before, um, those are the kind of data that you cannot unsee. Um, you cannot unsee um, the disparities that's happening in our public housing facilities right now or on the streets um, for our homeless families. Um, and so it's it really hits to your core and it hits at the heart. Um, and that's why that's what motivated me and our colleagues to work very quickly to stand these programs up. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay, operations? I just wanted to, because I see some of them going in and out. Yes, we can hear you, Madam. Yes, okay. you. So I, I'm, as I prepare to wrap this up, I just want to say before we move on to the next agenda item, that um, um, to all the um, uh, individuals who have commented or the ones perhaps that are listening and perhaps want to comment, I just want to let you know that we have heard you. And um, I want to thank uh, my fellow commissioners uh, for the good discussion, for the good questions um, uh, with Director Sue. One of the things that, the reason why I asked her about the equity um, um, zones and the equity frame in which this work is being done in, uh, in the speed of light, um, uh, considering that we had no roadmap uh, before us, is that an important thing about equity is that it, it demands that you we, 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 we take information that we know and that you have to make decisions with it. Um, and one of the things that I want to uplift that um, Director Sue said is that there is a time that when you do equity work, that it actually demands that you have to do prioritization. That means that if all things are being equal, if they all are equal, what um, is the fairest thing that you can do for the members of the community that need it the most? That, by definition, is what equity is. And so I, I'm saying this as we are trying to hold all the members of our community, all of our patrons of the library, who um, um, it's a beloved institution in this city, and we are in a crisis. We are in an educational, economic, and a social crisis. And those populations in our community, homeless populations, um, particularly the children that are homeless, and young people and adolescents that are at the margins of our society based upon the data that we know, I can understand as the commission president, um, and I can also say that I appreciate the work that is coming out of the uh, Department of Children and Families um, as they have uh, presented that they have gone out to a multitude of agencies, both public and private, and that um, out of all of our, um, our, our areas, they were looking at specific areas. And I wanna thank um, um, City Librarian Lambert, but even more so, I wanna thank his team that have been responsive because they have responded in no time at all to try to serve um, the needs, particularly of the most vulnerable of patrons, the most, most vulnerable of our patrons. And I know that that is probably a difficult thing for for us to hear, but not all patrons are as vulnerable as others, because not all people are as vulnerable as others. We do have to make some priorities, and I just want to say thank you very much to Maria um, um, for spending this time with us, because this was a very important conversation. It's not over. Um, as you heard from the commission, um, there are questions that we have, um, and we do have a responsibility to the public uh, to continue to ask these difficult questions. And so we look forward to our continued work together. We're grateful for our partnership with you, and um, we look forward to seeing you again in the future and make sure that you're taking some time um, to care for yourself. Thank so you. as we go on to our next agenda item, um, number three, we are going to talk about 
the San Francisco Public Library reopening um, uh, plan and update. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to the uh, city librarian to lead us into this discussion. Thank you, President Wardell. Library staff is pleased to bring you this update on the library's reopening efforts with the launch of SFPL to go. You may recall at the July 9th Library Commission meeting, we were still getting organized with our plans to implement our contact free service model. This past week witnessed the successful reopening of the main library and the Excelsior Branch Library. And we've put together this presentation to update you on how things are going and what's on the horizon. As a reminder, SFPL to go is our contact free front door service model. Patrons can reserve their items online, by phone or via email. And we notify our patrons when their items are ready for pickup. Patrons can visit the main library or the Excelsior branch to retrieve their holds while practicing physical distancing and wearing masks to protect everyone's health and safety. Here are some images from last Monday's reopening of the main library. I want to applaud the first floor staff who prepared hundreds of reserved items for pickup. The facility staff and public affairs staff did a great job working with the first floor staff to set up the signage and the decals on the ground, denoting where people could stand while they queued up. Our custodians, our security, everybody pitched in. It was really a team effort. And last Monday, I had the pleasure of meeting a father with his two school-aged children patiently waiting in line. He was so excited to be able to pick up some books that he had reserved all the way back in March. And he was commenting how great it was to have access to the library's collection again. And the very next day, the Excelsior Branch Library team launched SFPL to go service at our first pilot branch location. This team also did an excellent job setting up and launching for scores of youth and families who took advantage of the service last week. District 11 Supervisor Safai was present that morning and he was engaging with library patrons on the sidewalk and welcoming them back to the Excelsior Branch. Our Mayor London Breed tweeted out a viral video that showed all the holds bagged up and neatly organized. I saw this video that evening was also picked up by Cron4 News. And I know our patrons are ecstatic to finally be able to return their books that they've been patiently waiting and, and hanging on to for the past five months. In conclusion, week one was successful in easing our workforce back into the swing of things. We saw approximately 800 patrons visit our two SFPL to go sites. And things will start picking up now uh, as we fulfill more and more requests for materials. This week, we've recalled library staff who will be standing up our next four library locations for SFPL to go the Marina Branch, Merced, Mission Bay, and Eureka Valley Branch Library. We're targeting Tuesday, September 1st for these locations to launch Holds Pickup. And once we reopen these four libraries, we'll be in a better position to assess our capacity for reopening more SFPL to go locations. The Presidio Branch, Parkside, Park, Golden Gate Valley and West Portal branches are all options for future phases of reopening. We're still assessing our capacity to reopen SFPL to go at any of the Learning Hub sites and run those services concur concurrently. Um, I also want to call attention to the fact that the wildfire season has started this week with a vengeance. And this has already impacted library operations with a temporary suspension of SFPL to go service yesterday afternoon when the air quality degraded into the red unhealthy category. Furthermore, the city's COVID central command has requested the library be on standby to open the main library, Chinatown branch and Mission Bay branch as air respite centers should the air quality deteriorate into the purple 
or very unhealthy category. Library management will continue to monitor the air quality index and be poised to respond to changes in the air quality in the days and weeks ahead. And that concludes my presentation and my team and I were more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, uh, City Librarian Lambert. Now, um, operations, we are going to move to a general comment um, on this agenda item. Madam President, there's uh, one caller in the queue. Thank you. Would you put the caller through for general comment? Caller, your three minutes begins now. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. We can be reached at libraryusers2004 at yahoo.com. Too bad nobody can walk up and say hello, or vice versa. We can also be reached at P.O. Box 170544, San Francisco, California, 94117-0544. The San Francisco Public Library reopening plan <clears throat> excuse me, has changed from the, just, from the one that was just described last month at the July 9th special meeting of the Library Commission, particularly with respect to locations, which we were previously told were selected for, among other reasons, equity. Are we now to have unequitable openings or less equitable ones? Does the library just do whatever the mayor asks without any discussion or uh, pushback on what its plans are with respect to what I think and many other people think is an essential service for all people, including kids? Uh, we are also very concerned that there has been no mention whatsoever of access to all important newspapers and magazines and other non-circulating materials which often include some of the library's most interesting and most valuable materials. Although some of them are not especially valuable, they're just perhaps the only one that the library has. Uh, in this time, and especially where there is so much, let's put it politely, bad news, rubbish, particularly on the internet, and we're hearing about all kinds of rumors and whatnot being pushed by people who are intending to essentially give bad news, I think of all times, now is the time when we urgently need to have access for the public to current, current matters like newspapers and magazines, uh, and to have those either circulating or available in some fashion uh, at the sites or behind window, windows or in some other as well. Uh, in addition, the service of um, uh, pick-up and drop-off should be as normal, including receipts for what you have borrowed, and as a previous speaker has mentioned previously, receipts for materials being returned, so they can be sure that they are clear that they have returned their materials. There's a lot more to say, but um, time is running out. Thanks very much. Brenda. Thank you for your comment. Um, is there any other commenters in the queue? Madam President, there's an additional comment. Sir. Oh, would you please put them put that person through? Caller, your three minutes begins now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I I'd like clarification on uh, two items. Um, I, as the city librarian just said. If I did not misunderstand, the uh, uh, returned uh, desk at the main was closed yesterday due to the fire uh, air pollution hazard. Um, it, was it closed today? Will it? Will how much? When you? Will you? When? If any? If ever will you close it again? How much notice will you give the public of such closures? Um, uh, I actually went, uh, had a conversation with a staff member yesterday who told me uh, that the, the plan 
uh, as as of uh, midday was to um, open the um, Latino room for um, clean air access facility. And when I showed up, um, she changed her story, which I found very frustrating. And uh, she did add some clarification, uh, which I think would be useful for city librarian to confirm right now. She said that unless and until the air pollution level reaches 200, uh, in the dangerous level of 200, um, unless that happens, won't open an air, a clean air room for those with, uh, you know, whose health might be endangered by the by the air pollution. Uh, so those are two points. Um, once again, I think to really, uh, I think the, uh, the the reopening has been done in a rather chaotic manner. Uh, as I said before, I feel very stressed out to return items. I have a whole lot of items out and I am very hesitant to return them all at once for fear that you might lose many of them and I would be stuck with a bill or some, some uh, uncomfortable situation where I have to uh, uh, prove that I've returned it without any receipt that I've returned it. So these are, and also once again, I think the library has an obligation to the um, thousands of us who don't have internet, who aren't getting any emails, and who don't have uh, access to the vast resources of the Internet, which you are currently providing to all of the thousands of San Franciscans who have access through your website. So this is an equity issue. Talk about equity. Uh, you have an obligation to serve uh, seniors, low-income, disabled people who don't um, have Internet, and you're not doing that. Uh, I think you need to address this. It's important to talk about equity. Three minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any further uh, commenters in the um, queue? Madam President, there are no additional commenters. Okay, so um, we're going to move this to commission discussion. Uh, commissioners, we're um, looking at item number three, and um, we have our city librarian here that can answer any questions. And I'd like to call on Commissioner Ono um, for your question. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Um, Maria Sue, I'm sure is on already, but uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I just had um, two comments. One, I appreciate everyone that has helped get SFPL to go off and running. Glad to hear that it was 800 people that have already participated. Um, I do look forward to September 1st and the other four branches um, being able to be open. Um, I am also very um, comforting to know that yesterday we did close for the safety of our employees because the air quality was quite um, stifling. Um, I am glad, you know, I, I'm sorry to the patrons that we're in waiting for their items, um, but we do want to make a commitment to our staff and to others who are waiting in line that they don't stand outside when the air condition or air quality is at purple or red or even um, orange. Um, I'm also glad to hear that we are still going to be air respite center um, going forward um, in spite of um, our or lack of um, other services available. Um, I do want to know I, um, if anyone was out there, if there's um, anyone that has issues, such as a senior maybe waiting in line, if we needed to provide chairs for them, or if the wait time in line was um, overwhelming for anybody. Thank you for the comments and the question, Commissioner Ono. Um, we have not witnessed an overwhelming response. The lines have been very manageable and uh, people are getting service very promptly. Um, 
I, I don't know that we have chairs outside, but that's a great idea. Um, we can take that under consideration. And I also want to reinforce what you said. We do prioritize the health and safety of our staff. And um, really, for everyone's edification, the air quality index, it has a color system. And Green is good, yellow is moderate, orange starts to become unhealthy for sensitive groups, and red is the unhealthy category. Um, when we reach the red phase, we will have to close our doors because our staff are exposed. They're right at the entrances of our building with the doors open. Um, so that's really the threshold for making that determination of whether or not we can continue uh, with SFPL to go operations. Um, and the air respite center operation, you know, we're still talking with the COVID central command and working out the logistics of how this uh, service will function. And uh, at this time, it looks like we will be called upon to stand up air respite centers when the air quality index reaches the purple or very unhealthy uh, threshold. So um, I will certainly keep the commission apprised as this further develops. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ono. Uh, Commissioner Wolf. Mr. Wolf, have you turned off your uh, turned on your microphone? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for uh, doing such a great job and being so attentive and um, passionate about making books available. So just thank you to everybody for making this possible. Thank you so much for that comment. Looking to see, or is there any more comments from um, other commissioners? So this is just an item for discussion. Seeing that there's none, I uh, want to thank you um, for the update, City Librarian, on the reopening plan. And at this time, um, I would like to invite us to move to agenda item number four, which is our City Librarian's report. This is um, this is uh, a report from the City Librarian that looks at our activities and makes announcements. And there's a number of uh, associated um, documents with the city library's report. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to our city library. Thank you, President Wardell. I have a number of items to share this evening and I'm pleased to introduce our first presenter. Ileana Pulu is our youth development coordinator and she will be presenting about the youth engaged in library leadership program, also known as YELL. Ileana. Thank you, Michael. Um, hope I can come in clear. Everybody can hear me? Can yes? hear you. Wonderful. Um, so good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share a bright part of my spring and summer with you um, with you all. Um, I've been able to present our key takeaways in years past with some of my favorite people, our branch teen services librarians, and the teens that have participated at those locations in person. Um, but this year and this summer, today's quick presentation will show the resilience of youth, um, the library's commitment to youth workforce development as a key priority and the adjustment and frankly growth mindset for having a successful program happen in a virtual space. Um, on this slide, you already see some of our youth staying healthy, wearing masks and subtly using tips they've picked up over the seven week session, including um, good lighting, uh, clean lines, framing and taking a good photo. Um, next slide, please. Um, so in our fourth year of YELL, we intended to continue and build on the success of the previous three years, um, but like many things, we're derailed by COVID. We had a great plan. We were going to have 60 youth participating at 10 sites with 14 librarians leading this task um, and a great uh, support system. Uh, then the bad problem happened. COVID-19 sh shut us down, shut our in-person programs 
down and we had um, a, another good backup plan. We were going to meet online with 12 youth and have um, myself um, and my co-lead volunteer coordinator, Fran Matthew, um, uh, deliver this program. And we ran into a great problem. We interviewed um, the teens. They were awesome and we loved them all. We received 48 applications uh, between March 1st and April 20th. Uh, we held 34 interviews in mid-May um, and we ended with 29 participants um, that participated in our seven-week program. Mind you, these teens also were dealing with distance learning at the time. Um, they are all local San Francisco Daily City youth and um, they were just they wanted to do something to help impact um, their community and their library and their summer. Um, so these teens attended two hour working sessions on Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, learned about a variety of library resources from guest speakers, um, including a welcoming from Michael and Maureen. They contributed to our Instagram channel um, by, by reviewing it and offering feedback. They led icebreakers, attended life skills workshops, and focused on their community impact projects. Um, next slide, please. Um, STEM has been a part, a large part of our summer learning program in years past and teens previously would watch Shadow Help and eventually create a STEM event for the community at their local branch. Um, this was our equivalent. Um, and we're actually leading into a fall series where many of these teens will be returning to help promote and showcase their work. Uh, one of these community impact projects was a team takeover of our STEM Challenge Yourself series. Um, this is a new series that the library, our librarians created in um, April and debuted in June, uh, where our librarians shared fun and creative STEM projects for youth to do at home using household items. That was really important for them to be able to have um, quick access to items. Uh, the teens created these group videos where they divided roles. Um, and some of those roles included creating a script, being the host, doing the graphics, being an editor and uh, completing the package. Um, next slide, please. These teens worked together to create group videos and they also created individual videos. So we have 25 of these STEM videos for, for, for our fall series um, and they cover topics from chemistry to physics to creative coding. Um, their audience is mostly elementary and middle, but they can also be aged up to high school. It was truly a pleasure to see their uh, passion for STEM um, translate into what a virtual program could look like. Next slide, please. Our other uh, community impact project was um, Tech for Elders. Um, and this was a partnership with the low-income housing Sequoia Living to help alleviate the pandemic intensified isolation for seniors. Um, and that was through weekly meetings with the friendly youth offering assistance on how to use the library and social media apps. Um, there were two major goals similar to to our STEM group, um, workforce development was very important, being able to, to speak to adults, um, find out what their problems are, develop problem solving and creative thinking, and delivering a polished product, and then learn about what the Bridge at Maine does um, in, in also furthering their mission to help our seniors in our community. Um, there was also our second goal was just having more civic awareness of the community needs. Um, and empathy and connection with another generation. Intergenerational programming was key for these teens. Um, they themselves uh, shared about um, social isolation. So they were really, um, they really wanted to help and to be able to talk to the seniors. Next slide, please. Um, we found that the prerequisite to any other type of tech request uh, was being able to meet on a video call um, as trying to explain a visual interface via audio is extremely challenging. So Yale developed uh, Zoom tutorials for a variety of devices and operating systems to help assist elders with gaining proficiency there. Um, these materials have already been used elsewhere by the library to assist patrons to join programming offered in um, Zoom webinars. And after using Zoom to meet with elders to respond to specific questions, 
um, Yale was able to capture those tutorials um, that the library on the library apps that their elders wanted to use. And you can see some of those here on this slide. Um, these tools have a clean, clear, standardized layout with large sans serif font developed in consultation with our library graphic artists. So it really was um, a group project all around. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned earlier, additional components of the program included um, life skills, social media, and um, learning about library resources. We also were able to have a financial literacy workshop, a resume building session using BrainFuse, and um, really, really important, and I think our, our sleeper skill was how to ask for letters of recommendation. Um, and also creating community created lists on um, BiblioCommons, learning how to use them and uh, learning how to create them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, these are some quotes from our Yale parents and our Yale teens. Um, so I, I, I invite you to read these. Um, and overall, I'm extremely proud of these teens and my co-leads, Fran and Joseph. Um, the teens are well-deserving of their scholarships. I myself am a product of parochial and SFUSD schools. I'm a user of our parks, of our libraries, um, and our other pu public institutions. and and a woman of Latino and Pacific Islander descent. Um, it is crucially important for the teens of our city to be able to see themselves in our libraries, learn about pathways to employment to return or serve their city and offer their feedback for improvements. I know there are improvements to be made um, and, I, and I welcome those. Um, so thank you for your continued support and um, it's time to share. Thank you for your leadership and all your hard work, Eliana. Up next, we have Michelle Jeffers, Chief of Community Programs and Partnerships, with an update on our One City, One Book announcement and our upcoming programming to highlight Latino Hispanic Heritage Month. Michelle? Thank you, Michael. Good evening, commissioners. Um, I don't know if you know, but this is my very favorite presentation to make all year, talking about One City, One Book and highlighting our biggest citywide literary event. For 16 years now, we've picked a single annual book that we hope everyone will enjoy and that will entertain, inform, enlighten readers by building bridges through literature that connect our community. Our selection committee, which features, which also features Commissioners Wolf and Commissioners Mall, along with a number of community partners and booksellers and librarians, works very hard to read so many books every winter and come to a consensus. It's sort of the best kept book club in the city, although completely contentious. Um, our choices are not always easy, but it's ultimately very rewarding to pick the book of the year, and this year is no different. Um, over the past, we've had some wonderful and illustrious authors like Rebecca Solnit, Dave Eggers, Armistead Mopin, Gus Lee, Tommy Orange, T. Bowie, to name just a few. And that's why I'm particularly excited to announce this year's book and author. Next slide, please. Danelle Miller, whose New York Times bestselling memoir, Know My Name, completely astounded us. She's also the youngest One City, One Book author we've ever selected and a debut author to boot, both unusual circumstances for this program. Uh, but her memoir, written while she was living in San Francisco, about her efforts to reclaim her identity and heal herself from a very widely known sexual assault, simply blew the committee away. Her writing is magnificent, and the story is poignant, heartbreaking, and inspiring. It's an honor to be able to recognize this survivor's tale and bring this book to wide attention in San Francisco. Next slide. Um, before I could bring this <laughs> announcement to you, um, the New York Times broke the news of our One City, One Book, uh, which was very exciting. And, and they were highlighting Chanel's artwork, which is featured currently in the exterior gallery at the Asian Art Museum next door to the main library. But I can't wait till everyone also delves into this book this, this fall and into the spring. Uh, in March of 2021, we'll feature programs about the book, including an author talk with Chanel, and we will tie it all into our Women's History Month programming. So stay tuned for more updates about everything we'll bring together for One City, One Book. Um, next slide. All right, I'm also here to talk to you about our Viva programming. 
Um, FIVA, of course, is our annual celebration of Latino Hispanic Heritage Month. As you know, we've been celebrating this Heritage Month for many years, and I often come and talk to you about it, about our special programs, our book lists, our story times, and more. This year, however, with the heartbreaking effects of COVID-19 on San Francisco's Latino community in particular, we thought that recognizing um, this theme was more important than ever. And that's why we've added the, the subtitled Harvesting Hope, because we want to bring a spirit of hopefulness and helpfulness to our audience, whether by providing information and helpful resources, as well as by hiring the presenters, authors, and performers that reflect and support this community. Next slide, please. Um, we're very excited, first of all, to feature our On the Same Page book selection for September and October with local author Benjamin Boxiera. Interestingly, Benjamin is someone we met last year when we hosted our One City, One Book author, Tommy Orange, at City College of San Francisco. Benjamin um, agreed to be on stage with Tommy and asking the questions and interviewing him, and it was a wonderful discussion. Benjamin is an educator, poet, activist, and Mission District native. His new book, Puraneta, is the long-awaited sequel to his first book, Barrio Bushido, and is being released um, mid-September from Pochino Press. It's set in San Francisco's Mission District, and the book explores the creative struggle of homeboys and homegirls fighting against gentrification, police brutality, racism, and economic and educational injustice, all very timely topics for today. Um, we will have several book club discussions on the book, and Benjamin will join us and be interviewed by Luis Rodriguez, who is the author of Always Running, La Vida Loca, and most recently, From Our Land to Our Land, Essays, Journeys, and Imaginings from a Native Chicanx Writer. Next slide, please. Even though we're virtual, we still have a full slate of literary events in September and October in honor of Viva. Uh, we have Roberto Lovato and Ingrid Rojas Contreras discussing books, writing, and Lovato's new memoir, Unforgetting, which recounts his 2015 trip to El Salvador to investigate the country's horrific gang wars. We also feature queer brown stories over time and space, which features queer Latinx cultural producers sharing examples of how events, artwork, and political stories have elevated social justice movements in the U.S. over the last few decades. Author Celia Starr will be with us to present her book, Frida in America. This is the story of how three years spent in the U.S. transformed Frida Kahlo into the artist we know today. The former uh, San Francisco Poet Laureate Alejandro Merguea offers a panel of poetry readings with us. And we'll also learn the history of Dia de los Muertos in a Spanish language program with artist Calixto Robles. Lincoln Cushing, an activist, historian, and graphics collector, will discuss Cuban graphics with links to the Bay Area. And the World Literature Book Club will be reading Robert Bolano's The Savage Detectives, which chronicles the strange journey of two Latin American poets as seen through the eyes of people they cross, people whose paths they cross around the world. Next slide. We're also hosting a number of artist talks, including in anticipation of SF MoMA's Diego's Rivera, Diego Rivera's America exhibit, scholar Will Menez will discuss Rivera's trajectory in San Francisco, including those who, who assisted Rivera's artistic endeavors in 1930 and in so doing developed his last US work, the Pan American Unity Mural a decade later, which as you may know, has been on view at San, at San Francisco City College. Um, Robert McDonald of the Bond Latin Gallery presents Mexico and San Francisco, a visual presentation of Mexican artists who were instrumental in a movement blending politics and beauty. This is a partnership with the Mexican Museum and the Botan Latin Gallery. And we have a number of partnerships with the museum this year, including the artist Daniel Lizama, a contemporary Mexican painter who will be with us virtually to discuss his visual, visual retrospective opening at the museum and his art career. Next slide, please. For youth programs, we will be um, offering a number of events in Spanish language for the community, including a weekly Spanish virtual story time every Thursday. We will offer a Spanish language cooking class making Chilean appetizers. And we have a school success community chat with community educators from the Early Literacy Network who are helping parents navigate the distance learning experience that we're all facing this fall, um, also in Spanish. And we featured the Tricycle Music Fest favorites, The Lucky Band, a Latin Grammy-winning artist who will be offering a kids' concert on September 23rd. Next slide. 
Finally, more um, youth virtual program highlights. We have Latinx authors Ada Salazar, Rebecca Balcaceral, and Reina Luz Alegre, who are members of the author collective Las Musas. They'll share their latest and upcoming works, discuss Latinx cultural elements in their work, talk about what inspires them, and give advice for young writers. It will be a great panel for both kids and adults who love creative writing. We're also partnering again with the Mexican Museum for a virtual craft workshop to make a mate paper paintings um, using a, a craft that we'll create using paper bags, paints, and crayons. We hope most items that people will have in their home. A mate paper is a type of bark paper that is um, that was originally found in Mesoamerican cultures and it's still used in contemporary art today in Mexico. And finally, um, Oakland and San Francisco Public Libraries will team up to talk about everything they love and look for in high quality Latinx kid literature. Fresh from service on the 2020 Pura Bel Pere Book Award, Pat Tony from Oakland Public Library and Christina Mitra from our own San Francisco Public Library will take a deep dive into past favorite books and future titles not to be missed, giving recommendations to parents and kids. And that concludes my Viva presentation, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate your stewardship of the annual One City, One Book Committee, and I look forward to reading the book. I'm 176 on the holds list. Uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to acknowledge our database and statistician librarian, Jack Tilney, who is currently also serving as the acting chief analytics officer while his boss is away on leave. Uh, Jack has been chosen to represent the San Francisco Public Library on the Public Library Data Alliance, or PLDA. The PLDA was created through the National Measures That Matter Initiative, and this was organized by COSLA, which is an acronym for the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies, and it was funded by the Institute of Museums and Library Services, or the IMLS. As background, the Measures That Matter initiative began in 2016 to help coordinate industry-wide conversations to examine, evaluate, map, and develop the landscape of public library data collection in the United States. It's focused on developing data collection models that reflect the public library's changing role in the 21st century with data standards that effectively measure outcomes as well as outputs in order to better communicate the public library's role in communities. A key initiative in the Measures That Matter Action Plan was the creation of the Public Library Data, data Alliance to help steer its goals forward. The core purposes of the Measure That Matter Action Plan that PLDA will inform include moving from outputs to outcomes to recognize the changing library landscape, improving collection and dissemination of data demonstrating the impact of libraries, and reducing redundancies in data collection. As an association made up of key stakeholders in developing data collection and analytics from state and national library organizations, PLDA, PLDA strives to collect and disseminate ideas related to public library data measurement, ideally developing use cases for data measurement and reporting. We are super proud of JAG's participation and representation of the San Francisco Public Library on this national work group. He will serve for three years and bring a new voice to the conversation. The PLDA will convene virtually for the first time in the next several weeks, and SFPL is pleased to be one of the few, one of the select few public libraries involved in this important national effort. And Jack is here this evening, and I'd like to give him an opportunity to share anything he'd like to add regarding his appointment. Well, thank you, Michael, and good evening, commissioners. I won't take up too much of your time, but I do want to share my excitement in joining a national conversation among public libraries and public library agencies to improve and develop meaningful library metrics. I want to thank San Francisco Public Library and particularly our Chief Analytics Officer, Randy McClure, for encouraging me to apply to join the Public Library Data Alliance. 
I'm continually uh, inspired by the breadth of skills and knowledge that my colleagues Randy and Yoon bring to SFPL's research strategy and analytics unit. And I'm really proud that, that our collaborative work helps to improve SFPL's operations and services. Um, I look forward to taking the knowledge that we have developed uh, in the research strategy and analytics unit to share with the Public Library Data Alliance. And I look forward to seeing what members of the Alliance will create together as we collaboratively deepen our efforts to develop measures that matter for public libraries, measures that align with di diverse and ever-changing community needs, and measures that accurately and effectively represent the vital resources and services provided by public libraries across this country. Thank you. Bravo, Jack. Congratulations on your appointment. We're so proud of you. And that concludes the City Librarian's report. Thank you so much, uh, City Librarian Lambert. Um, at this time, um, we're going to go to our public comment on this agenda item, and then we'll um, um, uh, allow the uh, commission to come back for discussion on any of the items. Um, operations, can you um, prepare and put through the first public comment? Commenter? Uh, Madam President, at present, there are no commenters in the queue. I would just remind call in users to press star three in order to be added to the queue. It looks like we have one now. Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. You can put the caller through. Caller, your three yeah. minutes begins now. This is Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. I don't know why I was not on the list immediately. I pressed star three earlier after the other comments had concluded. Uh, a mystery, thank you for waiting a moment to give people a chance to get back into the queue for uh, when they've been excluded for whatever reason. Um, there's a great deal to be discussed here, uh, and uh, I'd certainly be interested to hear a lot more. Uh, and to see a lot more documentation. So with starting with the statistics, uh, first of all, Jack Toomey has done yeoman work uh, with statistics, and whenever I have sought statistics from the library, by and large, I have found that, you know, he's been very intelligent, very understanding, cooperative, and forthcoming. Uh, I'm not sure whether his three-year appointment means he's leaving San Francisco Public Library or his duties here. I'd be very curious to know because I'd hate for him to be leaving. Uh, I'm very troubled by this program, which is full of vague terms, measures that matter. What is that? And what's wrong with the old measures? Libraries have been, for many, many, many decades, been busy with determining what should be the measures of their productivity of their output. And now we just simply are discovering, boom, output is out, outcomes are in. Well, what are outcomes? Uh, what's wrong with the outputs? For example, what's your circulation? What's your circulation per capita? What's your expenditure on books per capita? What's wrong with such kind of measures? And which measures do you want to get rid of from the old uh, set and replace them with what? We haven't heard a single goal. We've heard goals referenced, but no actual goals that have to do with performance, with uh, usefulness to, guess who? The public. And there's no representation from the public whatsoever in any of this, uh, in any of the participants here that are shown. With respect to the uh, uh, Kids program, Tech for Elders. Uh, I'm very concerned about the potential for patron, patronizing and uh, uh, infantilizing. I'm very concerned with privacy issues that have not been discussed and are very big in whatever you do, including Biblio Commons. And I'm not clear what the connection with Sequoia is. What happened to free and equal access? Is that just a location or is that a qualifying group of people that are alone and able to, in being able to qualify. Important questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other callers in the queue? Madam President, at present there are no additional commenters. Okay, great. OK, 
Okay, commissioners, I'd like to uh, bring this to you for discussion. Um, the city librarian reports before you, and you have the other members of the library team um, who um, are also available. Um, Commissioner Ono? Or is that from the last time? No. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Thank you everyone for your presentation, Ziliana. Um, I think I need to go to the Tech Four Seniors class. Um, there were presentations that looked very helpful for me and my sisters. Um, I've been trying to get a video call with them, and for the life of them, bless their heart, they can't get it done. <laughs> um, so I might call on you to help us. But I think the Yale program is great. It, it makes great leaders for our future, and I applaud you and your team. Uh, Michelle, I always look forward to um, one book, uh, one city, one book, and I'm Connie. We're on the um, committee. It is a great selection. I can't wait to put my name on the wait list behind Michael. So I guess I'll be number 800 or whatever. Um, and Viva, I'm looking forward to the Viva and uh, his um, this all the events next year. Uh, Jack, uh, congratulations on your appointment. Um, I am a data wonk every once in a while, so I don't, I won't try to harass you, but I do um, applaud you for getting on this committee and representing San Francisco and California. So thank you all. This is one of the best parts of most of our meetings, just hearing from everything that the staff and the library has done for the city. So thank you all. Um, Commissioner Lee. Okay, great. Just unmute myself. Yeah, I'm excited that. about, yeah, I'm excited about the Yale program. Got a couple of questions. Uh, I understand that the 43 applied, but only 29 was taken. I'm wondering what happened to the 14. Good, good question. Can I risk? I can answer, right? Yes, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, what happened to the other 14? Well, we did discover that some teens were also had um, summer school over the summer. They had conflict. Some were taking um, classes at City College. Um, so they had conflicting schedules. Um, so we were not able to, um, to, to take them due to that conflicting schedule. Uh, we did not say no to anybody. If it, if it warms your heart, they said no to us. So um, we wanted all of them. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, because then they uh, get to make their decision whether they have the other one or this one, which will let them learn the wonderful life skills. Because yes. the life skill, uh, early on, there was a comment from the public about outcome. To me, the life skill is the outcome. It is not the 29 candidates that are participating that is the output, not the outcome. So I hope that uh, uh, that is uh, an example that Jack would agree. That that's a measure of uh, outcome. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Lee, for that comment. You have another one? Yes. Yeah, so okay. The other one is about the excitement. The other excitement is about uh, Jack's uh, into about the outcome. This outcome is what excites me. <laughs> Why circulation is circulation. It's what does it do? So until that we know how is the outcome about the circulation, that is more meaningful in terms of um, making decision of uh, allocation of resources to gain the most outcome, to gain the most impact. So that, that is my comment and on the two items that excite me. And of course, the other uh, wonderful programs uh, certainly makes me salivate. I just have to wait in the queue. So I appreciate the, uh, despite the pandemic, the bright minds in the library is still churning, churning and churning. I'm very thankful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Wolf. 
Oh, I just wanted to say that uh, there's if there was a theme to this to today's meeting, it would be the idea of pivoting. And in this report, but we've really been hearing about that throughout the meeting today. And I just want to say what a uh, how see that at every turn, um, the best plans have been under been undermined without any uh, uh, fault of the staff. And I'm just very inspired by the moment when everything changes, that every staff member kind of rises to the occasion, comes up with a new idea and doesn't let the disappointment slow them down, but only fuels them to come up with better ideas. And I think we've just seen that across the board. And I just want to commend um, Michael for his leadership and the um, for just rising to the occasion and demonstrating that under the most adverse circumstances, great things can happen. So thank you. Thank you so much for that um, important comment, Commissioner Wolf. Other commissioners, um, comment and or questions for the library staff on this um, uh, director's report. Okay, seeing that there's none, um, I, I want to thank all of the presenters. Um, each one of you, the work that you're doing is so significant and I won't um, belabor it, but I just want to say that we see you um, we're thrilled about the uh, selection. I did read the article first in the New York Times. Yeah, so I saw it too, Michelle. They, but they didn't really really make it clear that, she, that it was our library. But if you really read the article, you saw that, that um, it was. And um, I'm excited about having a young artist be featured uh, by a world-class city. So thank you all. And also thank you for Commissioner Wolf as well as... Um, uh, Susan, um, Patricia Mall for your service in that um, all city, um, one propensity um, committee process. So we're going to move on to the item, uh, uh, which is the, the agenda number five, which is the approval of the minutes of July 9th. And um, as we, um, as the first thing we're going to do um, is to uh, ask for our general public for item number five. Madam President, there's one caller in the queue. Can you put that caller through, please? Caller, your three minutes starts now. So this is Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. We can be reached at Library users 2004 at yahoo.com. Also by mail at P.O. Box 170544, San Francisco, California 94117 0544. Uh, unfortunately, people can't say, hey, liked what you said or thought that what you said was a, an issue uh, when we are in person at meetings like this. Uh, and uh, something good to say about the minutes, uh, the minutes are actually quite a bit more extensive and seem to be generally better than we've heard before, than we've seen before. Uh, in previous, uh, shall we say, administrations. Um, I did want to say that uh, it's rather difficult to follow what's going on here, uh, to see who's present, to see what faces look like, to see who's commenting. It's difficult even to know who is speaking. People don't announce their names. The chair doesn't announce their names. So I would like to make a document request. I would like to see all of the recordings, the video recordings with audio of these meetings, what you are seeing currently and what I understand is being recorded. Uh, and so this is a request to the president of the library commission and also to the head of the library that Library Users Association would like to see <clears throat> uh, the record of these meetings 
that we've had now the third one of almost to the end uh, because it's my understanding that the video is not not only not posted, which has been the case in the past, but not available. And I'm not sure what that means. It's a document you create. It's appropriate. Uh, other departments and other uh, commissions and so on enable folks to see what happened at their meeting. And it, it would be particularly a matter of interest because, as I said, it's not clear to me who was speaking at times. Uh, uh, presentations and when people were coordinating with rep with presentations. So I would like to request that at this time as a formal request of the city librarian and the library commission president. Thanks very much. Thank you. You're um, are there any further uh, commenters in the queue? Madam President, there are no additional commenters. Okay. All right, commission, we have an action to take. Um, we happen to have a uh, the approval of the minutes of July uh, 9th, and um, um, is there any commissioner who would like to make a motion? Let me look at my screen because I have to make sure. Raise your hand. Okay, uh, Commissioner Wolf would like to has made a motion. Let the record show that Commissioner Wolf has made a me uh, motion. Um, would the uh, commissioner like to, anyone like to make a second? John Lee, second. Okay, stands for the record that uh, John Lee has seconded uh, the motion. Um, I'm monitoring the participant list to make sure that I'm not missing anyone. Okay. Um, are there any questions um, um, or further discussion in regard to this motion or any no further uh, uh, discussion? So all those in favor uh, for approving the minutes, um, if you can say aye, and one of the ways you say aye is by raising your hand and then I'll go through and do a verbal roll call. All those in favor, say aye, and I'll, that also raise your hand. Aye. Okay, I, see, I see to uh, the record show that Commissioner um, Ono approves, says aye. Commissioner Wong approves, says aye. Commissioner Lee approves, it says aye. I forget it. And uh, Commissioner aye. Wolf has said aye. And um, Commissioner Vice uh, President Maul has said aye. And thank you. Um, is there the motion a passes. The motion passes. Thank you. So we're going to move on to our final item of the agenda, um, which is the adjournment. And this requires our action as well. Um, and at this time, I'd like to call for our final public comment. Madam President, uh, there's one caller in the queue. Thank you. If you put the caller through. Caller, your three minutes begins now. Yes, thank you. This is Peter Warfield, Executive Director of Library Users Association. We can be reached at libraryusers2004 at yahoo.com and also by mail at P.O. Box 170544, San Francisco, California, 94117-0544. Uh, it's become a uh, habit, I guess, for us to be saying that we would like to see you have on your agenda what prior commissions have had regularly on their agenda in times past recently. I'm hearing noises, and I don't know what that is. And that is what commissions in the past and many other commissions currently uh, and other bodies have on their agenda toward the end, and that is uh, an item where they can discuss and suggest, well, mainly suggest items that they would like to have on future agendas for discussion or action. 
So, for example, today you had a very good question by Commissioner Ono, and she asked about wait times. Very reasonable and very patron-oriented. Uh, do people have to wait in the cold or the heat? How long do they have to wait? What if they have disabilities? Uh, and so on and so forth. But what she did not ask, and what might be added to that question in general, is what is the service level and what is the service standard for the library to go service? Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, people who have placed reserves, holds, on library materials and have been waiting for a long time, or what's a long time, to be uh, notified that those materials are available. I've had something on hold since very early July, and six weeks later have not heard anything with regard to when it's coming. I have a neighbor who likes books, even though she's very well connected electronically. And uh, she has commented that uh, she's not clear what's going on, but uh, certainly a week after opening, she hasn't heard anything about her long time reserved material. So I think that that would be very useful not only to have a future agenda item on, uh, but to discuss at length and to maybe solicit the public with regard to how that's working out for the public. And likewise, I think there should be a thing about how these meetings are conducted and whether there are frustrations or difficulties that people have and what maybe they suggest might be done to improve it. Great, those are things Thank you. you're putting up. Thank you for your comments. Um, operations, are there any further uh, members of the public? Madam President, Madam President, there are no additional callers. Okay, uh, Commission, um, we are at our adjournment. And is there a motion to adjourn? Um, Madam President, I'd like to make a, a comment before we move to, to adjournment, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead, President. We, um, um, thank you. Uh, I'll keep this brief, but but uh, I'd like to remind the public that, of course, the um, you know as a body, we are we are committed to providing um, you know access for the public to make comments on uh, agenda items. As as an attendee, you can have a, a designated amount of time to comment uh, more generally at the start, and then on every agenda item, including the adjournment. Uh, and as an attendee, you can make full use of those opportunities or for most attendees, um, um, listen along, that, that is completely fine. Um, and so with that as a backdrop um, and, and knowing that we are committed to allowing everyone, uh, all of our attendees that access. Um, uh, I received a, um, a note from uh, an organization that, that I'll anonymize, but I do, did want to read because I, I did have some particular concerns about it. Um, that I wanted to to um, reassure uh, the, the public about a, a couple points. Um, and I'll, I'll quote um, while trying to anonymize the note as much as possible. The, the note reads uh, towards the bottom, for your information, our organization intends to participate in every meeting and to make public comment on every agenda item. We ask for continued notification of any future meetings on the same basis as the commission and any majority of commissioners and we also ask you to be alert if we are not clearly on your list of those wishing to make public comment on any agenda item or are going to be omitted from making public comment, something's wrong. And, and I read that as if to say that uh, just because um, you, you know, uh, a particular individual organization is expected to uh, make a comment based off of the previous track record of making comments uh, at, at meetings that we ought to wait for them or seek their comment out. Um, and I just wanted to share my perspective, which is that library commission meetings don't have rewards programs. Just because you, you come and, and speak 20 meetings in a row does not mean you grant uh, a, a level of privilege, uh, uh, just like uh, how in person, if you happen to not show up, we will also not go and find you at your house and bring you to the meeting and make sure that you attend. Um, in the spirit of providing equal access, that is clearly for, for the rest of the attendees and the participants, uh, not a fair way to go. Uh, and, and I recommend to the rest of our body that, that we do not create uh, any special privileges uh, for anyone uh, based solely on their 
participation record, let's say, um, in these meetings. Um, but with that, I, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Huang. Um, is there a uh, motion to second it? I see it. Thank you, Commissioner Wolf. Um, is there any further discussion? This adjourning item? Seeing that there's none. Um, all those in favor to adjourn this evening's meeting, say aye, and I will have to go through and do roll call for the record. Um, go ahead and put your hand up um, or say hi so I can see you. Okay, Commissioner Wolf said aye. Um, Commissioner Ono has said aye. Uh, aye. Working. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Mall has said aye. And I still haven't heard from Commissioner Lee. I can't see you. Hi. Commissioner Lee has said aye. And um, Commissioner Wong has already made the motion. So um, we, um, and, and there are any individuals that there's actually no one left to say no. So this meeting um, is adjourned. I want to thank you all for your uh, participation. Thank you again to the city librarian for robust um, uh, an agenda. And um, thank you for all the members of the public who have uh, persevered to the end. Um, we appreciate you. We thank you so much for your continued support um, of the San Francisco Public Library. Have a good evening. Thank you, Madam President. The motion passes.